This is the Cameron Journal Podcast. It's a place where we talk about important things. It's a place where we bring a little slice of the news to you. And it's a place where we do important things, have important conversations. It's also things that I like to talk about. My name is Cameron Cowan, and this is the Cameron Journal Podcast. Today on the Cameron Journal Podcast, we are joined by Tio Levinson. He is the author of Lull and Storm, which is a real fascinating thing about container transportation industry. Now, ordinarily, I wouldn't take on a book like this because it's for industry, probably the rest of us could be bothered. But considering what's happened with the pandemic and logistics and how we've all had to learn probably way more about containers than we ever all wanted to know. Um, I thought it would be a good to have a chat about what has gone wrong with the supply chain and find out more about this book and all those type of things. So this is going to be a good conversation. So welcome to you to the Cameron Journal podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Cameron. Yes. Why don't you start us off with what is Lull and Storm and why did you write the book? Yes, yeah, sure. So Lull and Storm is an idea that I have for the past four years. Um, I'm usually working with universities here in Europe, and uh, usually I'm receiving tons and tons of questions, right? About you know uh, what should be, uh, what should be you know the process when it comes to a containers exporting and so on. And I say, okay, right, you know, let's think about like a practical guide, right? When we can we could help people like newcomers in the industry to make sure that they can understand what are what things are mandatory when it comes to exportation, especially exportations, right? What are you know um, the modus operandi of uh, shipping lines, of freight forwarders, uh, of terminals and arbors, right? So it's basically it's like, it's like let's say it's a uh, an appetizer, right, for the for the industry. It means like you there's tons and tons of things to to remember, right? So I mm-hmm. say okay. Let's 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 think about something quite easy. So, like you know, it's the book is not that long; it's less than fifty pages, right? But we can easily go back to, uh, you know, the fundamentals, right? It's only the basics, the one hundred and one, let's say. Right? <laughs> yeah. So, what are the what are some of the basics of containerization and import export? It's it's a it's a hidden system that most people know nothing about. So anything you say will increase our knowledge a hundredfold. Right. The first thing about containerized shipping, I would say it's uh anticipate everything, right? You need to anticipate everything. So we we usually uh, I we usually you know um more we pay more attention to things we see, right? So we pay more attention to cars, to trains, to airport, right? Um, the shipping industry is like it's hidden for the for the most part of us because it's part it's in the sea, right? So we don't we don't spend our time, you know, uh, in the sea or like you know, or people who are living are you living uh, you are on the west coast, so perhaps you see more harbors and so on, but. Well, I, I, I think, live moments away from the port of Seattle, so we have ships coming and going all the time, and you can see the <laughs> the cranes and the the port traffic in West Seattle can get quite insane. So yeah, yeah, that's it's insane. But if you don't live in a city on a major port on a coast, you kind of don't know it, you know. Well, you if you don't, don't live it. in Seattle or you know Long Beach and Los Angeles or San Francisco, which are the big three West Coast ports, it it is really hidden. And if you live in the middle of the country, forget it. <laughs> Yeah, if you are in the country, if you're in the countryside, you're in the country. Yeah, forget it. Of course, um, I would say, yeah, it's um, it's it's really. Um, I think it's a really fascinating industry because we realized we, you realize that you know we couldn't like have this international trade as it is today without it, right? So, 
I would say the things to to know about it is that it's vital for almost everything we do. Yeah. So the the next kind of question I want to ask you um, is about the the supply chain logistics of everything that happened during yeah. the pandemic. What happened? Yeah. <laughs> and and, and, and as far and as far as I can tell, it's still not worked out. Like walk us through yeah. what went right, what went wrong. Yeah. And, are we will we ever unwind it it's it's like yeah it, i mean it's i uh, i i don't even have all the answers to be honest with you um the the, the and this is a really really good question so i would say uh a better one would be like why was this like so chaotic right so um after, like, you know, we started to have some, you know, more details and info, like, you know, since, you know, we it's almost like COVID never existed, right? Um, right. I would say, I would say that the, the, the first thing is that it was so chaotic because China, um, who's the world, who's the world's factory stopped working, right? So... I could I could say like in like yeah we have three steps right so what 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 happened they say like you know we were hit by a pandemic right so right. you know uh, starting in China all activities uh, starts to stop you know restrictions of goods and persons circulating you know so the world froze right um, then you need to understand where this started it started in Wuhan right so right. Wuhan is is in the center of China, right? And most of the thing people don't know is that Wuhan is the largest inland port in China. Meaning that, to give you an example, um, Wuhan is there, Chicago. Is, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like Wuhan, let's say like 200 of the 500 Fortune, of the, yeah, 200 of the Fortune 500, have supply chain interest in Wuhan. So it means that, you know, first China is the world's factory and the pandemic started in the epicenter of China's supply chain. So that's a bit problematic. And then the third component would be, when did this happen? And it started to happen at the end of the year, so COVID nineteen, December between December December twenty nineteen until February twenty twenty, right? And this is usually the Chinese New Year period, meaning that you know uh, factories are closed. You know we start to they start to close factories. Uh, people are traveling. It's like the you know their they their Chinese Thanksgiving, right? To give you right. a comparison, in you I think it's right among like around like fifty million people who are traveling across the U.S., right? In China yes. is 350 million. So imagine the, the entire US population moving around, right? So it's right. crazy. So in you know, in normal times, um, you know, the plants in February that would stop working for two to four weeks. And in normal times, you know, without in the pandemic free period, it will still be active. So imagine like uh, you know, imagine the imagine factory shut down between for eight weeks. 10 weeks and then they start to they start to go back and then people get sick or you need to do some tests you need to do pcr and stuff and stuff so i think this one was the reason why it was so chaotic and finally uh, you know at this period of time when it comes to containerized shipping so now we're talking about you know the maritimes the containerized maritime um, most of the containers you know are placed in china for export right so what happened it means that since everyone is in lockdown, everyone is stuck, everyone is the port are closed and so on. How can you how how can you uh, you know export containers to Long Beach? How can you export containers to Seattle? Right. So right. it started started from there. So I think it's one of the of course there's tons and all the components, but I think the three keys is to understand what happened, where, and when. Well, and there's also, I think, the the other difficulty um, uh, on this side of the water was that, you know, the ports shut because we were having lockdowns, especially in California. And so then you're not, containers aren't getting unloaded or if, you know, and, the, and then the ships were stuck out 
and they couldn't hardly get the crews off and they all had to get repatriated to their home countries and ship crews tend to be you know multiple nationalities so that was a whole mess on its own um, i remember i moved i moved back to seattle in 2020 and seattle is not on the ocean we're on the puget sound which is this little body of water that connects to the ocean but it's about 120 miles inland or so and ships as far as you can see out floating waiting to be unloaded someday maybe um and that took them almost two years we finally got i think they finally stopped having ships waiting in line in 2022 and um you know, it's just, you know, and that usually those ships don't sit longer than it takes the time to unload the containers they're dropping off and leave again. So um, that's uh, that was, you know, kind of impressive as well. And containers being stuck in the wrong place. You should have seen they had them piled higher and deeper. I'd never seen them pile them hundreds of feet in the air, just higher and higher and higher because there was nowhere to put them. There was nowhere to go. And it was just it just kind of became a a mess so exactly and especially especially in the u.s because you guys also had like an inland problem when it comes to drivers and haulage companies right who were on strike so yes like and the, the rail the railroads were unhappy the truckers are unhappy yes <laughs> you know we're, exactly. our country is very large so we need trucks and trains <laughs> exactly so it was an end-to-end -end mess really right from export yeah. to from export to you know the uh, maritime leg to on carriage it was a uh, it was a mess so yeah but then but you know i think this was a good a good like you know a good question about what happened my point is that you know if it would happen in brazil right we would face you know the shortage of uh, you know sugar or let's say uh, you know the commodities that are, you know um, you know inherent to brazil right but right. since China and Wuhan is the art of, let's say, international, almost like, you know, globalized like super chain. This is why it was so, so big, right? L look, for instance, what ha what's happening, uh, sadly, in Ukraine and Russia, right? We are mm -hmm. facing surge prices in a certain commodity, but not in everything, right? Whereas in with the, the, the COVID-19, especially for, with China, it was crazy, you know, uh, it, everything from toys to automotive for every industry were impacted right i, so, I never I, thought i would live to see the day where i would walk into an american grocery store and the shelves would be empty it felt like i was yeah. shopping in the soviet union like i mean i remember i was in charlottesville virginia and i was i was staying at this um mansion this antebellum mansion nearby and i was walking to the store and i was buying the last package of rice the last package of beef like grabbing like the last thing and just like seeing like what can i find that is edible in this building and i never ever in my wildest dreams ever thought that i would be shopping like that the shortages were crushing um yeah you know, and yeah, Europe, people were like you know uh, chasing uh you know paper toilets and so on it was uh it was hectic you know we were like shortage of, of paper toilets uh so it's I mean, yeah, it was, um, yeah, it, it was insane. Yeah. It was insane to realize that, you know, even from for simple things, like when it comes to, I don't know if you call it like this, Tylenol? Is it like, how do you call it? Tylenol? Yeah, Tylenol. Tylenol. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Acetaminophen. Tylenol, yeah, like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Tylenol, paracetamol, uh, you know, were produced in China. Right. So we started to, you know, we started to have some shortage from, even for, for, for things that's supposed to, not be made in China, you know? Yeah, so or it was coming from India, but then you couldn't get it moved. And I remember, you know, they the year I remember I think the French were shocked. The EU doesn't produce masks and PPE. It yeah, all comes from like, China. Yeah. It, and it's like 27 nations, nobody can make masks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's you know. well, no. If I if I were hungry or the Czech Republic, I would corner the market. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. No, it's, it's it's insane. And to be really honest with you, I'm not like I don't I don't want it. But like, let's say that if another you know pandemic scenario arises, uh, I'm not even sure that the European Union will be, will be prepared. Like, okay, we will have like uh, you know uh, and sanitizer, we will have Purell and masks, but uh, you know. 
we don't we're not we're not even sure that we'll still be ready. I, I don't I don't think that people even like even in the globalized supply chain, you know, people start to go back to their, you know, old habits. So yeah, yeah. It was really so I hope I, yeah. I responded to your question. No, 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 you definitely did. How was it um, as a, a professional working in the industry? What has it been like for the last couple of years? I mean, what has the day to day been like trying to unwind this mess? So, OK, so it's been it's been totally difficult. So it depends from from where you from where you stand. Right. So if you are a ship owner, like like, for instance, a company like you have a you have vessels and so on is probably have been the last the, the best two years of your industry right because of the shortage of uh you know transportations and so on you could put the price you wanted even even so right um right. so it was it was quite amazing uh in terms of uh, turnovers and uh you know you, you should check but you can see that clearly uh containerized shipping you know uh their earnings were you know uh, skyrocketed right so um it was quite good for it was really bad for people who are you know rely on supply chains of or you know uh, rely on um on you know uh, on exportations and importations and so on because you could for instance if you order a container for uh, let's say in february it's supposed to arrive uh, you know in march uh, then you're arriving march people say yes uh, you know it's not arriving so you need to wait two three four six even sometimes nine months so it was really a mess really a mess um for people relying on on you know importations and this is why people starting to look look for you know alternative route alternative routes alternative alternative solutions right so why not you know um move or part of a supply chain for instance in india in vietnam in uh, mexico and so on and uh, you could see right now that uh apple for instance um, is now moving part of its production of iphones in india because now they're realizing that if something's happened again in china and with you know trade war and so on um, it might be it might be difficult for them, you know, to, uh, you know, to to have like uh, to avoid disruptions. Um, so yeah, it's, it's been very difficult. Yeah, they're they're building a new a new MacBook plant in Texas, um, yeah, well, to build MacBooks in America, which is you know telling, <laughs> you know, very telling. Exactly, and something, but the, I think one of one of the main thing that and people started to forget it is the is the evergreen situation. You know, uh, with the canal, with the Suez Canal. So I was about to ask about that. Yeah, that's exactly. So this was a, a total mess because this is like, <laughs> I think the biggest you know gateways when it comes to to containerized shipping, even to the shipping industry itself. With the Panama Canal, they are both like you know vital for the international trade, and this this uh, uh, this uh, container ship being stuck for one week while we were still in pandemic with lockdowns and, you know, um, short supply. What's kind of, you know, okay, uh, are we going to even to get out of this, right? It was almost like crazy because people were relying of, on routes to be, you know, open and easily, um, easily accessible. So the solution would have been one of what people did is that some ship owners they waited right so they they slow down the pace of their vessels other had to pass you know south from south africa meaning that they have to spend more in fuel more in uh, uh more in seafarers uh, wages and so on which you know of course increases the price of the freight increases the price of the freight increases the final product and then you know uh to the final consumer right so it's right. a vicious cycle Yes. No, I mean, and that's, I mean, I think that was, I mean, I think the last couple of years have been a perfect storm because it's been like, you know, first the pandemic and China's out and then a ship gets stuck in the Suez Canal. It's like, <laughs> if it can go wrong, it has. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's been, wow. It's been, it's been really hectic. Uh, I was receiving perhaps, I think at this time, I was receiving perhaps 200, 300, 400 calls a day. Uh, because containers were stuck, people, uh, you know, were, were you know, uh, were stressed out. Uh, it was, uh, it was quite hectic, to be honest. 
Yeah. It was quite angry. And it mean it made me and also made me realize that people, as you said, you know, at the beginning of our of this podcast, that people were not quite aware of you know how things how things worked. Hence, you know, writing down this book, right? Perhaps it yeah. can help people to understand that, you know, shipping's shipping industry is not like the train, right? When the train leaves at two o'clock or at four o'clock, right? In shipping, right. we we use like ETAs. ETS and ETD, ETA, sorry, ETS and ETAs, meaning like estimate times of selling, estimate times of arrival, meaning, and we have and usually shipping lines of, you know, a three days, let's say leeway, right? So it means that uh, if it if it arrives three days after, you know, the ETA, the ETA, it's still fine, right? So it people need people needed to understand that it's not uh, you know it's not like uh, you know the air freight or the railways and so on the sea is quite unpredictable as well. So, yeah, it was yes. uh, quite an interesting, uh, an inter last, in last two years were quite interesting, yeah. Yeah, the other thing I wanted to ask, and I, I should have asked this sooner, um, how, how did you get into this industry? What's your, what's your background? How did you decide that, uh, you know, logistics and containerized shipping was your thing? That's that's a really good question. Thanks, man. Uh, I think, I think, yeah. Uh, so first, I started. I wanted to be like you know working in the you know uh, diplomacy and you know United Nations and so on. And then I realized it was oh, not me for too. Me. My first master's degree is in diplomacy. Really? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So you yeah. So did some uh, you know United Nation. Uh, um, let's say how we call it in in English. Um, let's say it was a. Uh, um, you know those um, uh, how we call it, uh, MacMune. How is it MacMune? How do you call it? You know those yeah. simulations. When you do you know like assembly simulations and so on? And yeah. I realized now nah, this is not for me. <laughs> I need to find something else, right? Uh, but still, I was still interested in you know international relations. You know how states can you know work together and trade and so on. And I had this opportunity to work in the ship broking company here in Europe. Uh, so they were specialized in, uh, you know, oil and gas. They were providing vessels for oil and gas offshores and offshore companies. So oil and gas companies on offshores. Um, and I was like, wow, this is, this is, as you said, this is a world that I, I don't understand. And I want to be part of it. Right. I was like yeah. the first day I was like, I was, it was a total mess. I was using cold and so on. And I remember my boss that I loved to like, she was like, are you, are you okay? I was like, no, but I was like, do you like it? I said, yes, but I don't understand a thing. Right. So it was quite, it was quite crazy. And from that, I started to, you know, to study, to, to understand, you know, the different parts of the industry. So you have like uh, oil and gas, you have containerized shipping, you have dry bulk and so on. And to specialize in the certain uh, in a certain area, I, st I do it like you know. I started to do a master's, uh, entering to another uh, a major career here in Europe, and then you know I started my my career. So it's been now like uh, in three years, going to be yes around. I'm close to ten years now. Yes, in the industry. Yeah, very nice. Yeah, I I was I was going to um I was going to go to the International Court of Justice, International Criminal Court in Brussels. And I wanted wow. to be an international lawyer and work there. That was my that was my angle. I, yeah, no, I was in grad school. I was doing a master's in diplomacy and asymmetrical warfare. I was learning French, um, and oh. yeah, and so uh, so that was. And then, but I unfortunately I graduated during the pan or not during the pandemic during the Great Recession. And so the demand for lawyers in two thousand nine, ten, eleven, twelve was non-existent and mm -hmm. my advisors were like if you can do something else anything else you should and so i left to go work in media and i worked in fashion for three years <laughs> and ran a magazine and then i did this and i went into media and writing and all this type of thing because i'd already worked in radio and that sort of thing and and kind of broke away from all that but that was that was the dream at one time so i totally get that career shift i think there's a, probably a lot of us our age that have been through something like that you know so and why french why do you want to learn french by the way 
Well, there's like two, so in diplomacy, diplomacy takes place in two languages, English and French. So like yeah. even like at NATO, they'll have like everything like UN is like this, NATO is like this. Everything will be in English and French because that covers two thirds of the planet. The French were very good at spreading themselves around the globe. And so, and especially in Africa, you know, besides native languages, French, between the Belgians and the French, they had so many colonies in Africa, French is like the, ling it's the lingua franca, except for local dialects, it's like the next, you know, best thing. If you're in Africa and you speak French, somebody somewhere will speak a little bit of French. And so as diplomatic languages go, well, it's like I'm American, so I already knew English. So it only made sense that f it was either going to be French or Spanish. You know, that's yeah. the because those are the next two big, you know, a lot of countries speak those languages. And I'm kind of like, yeah. well, I think French is my best bet because that gets me parts of Asia. It gets me parts of Oceania and it gets me a lot of Africa. And that's yeah. and it gets me some of Europe. So that's helpful, you know. So yeah. and I figured if I was going to be, you know, in that part of Europe, speaking French would be a good idea. So um, <laughs> true, true. And yeah, and I'd taken German as an undergrad as well. So, um, so that was, uh, yeah, so that was my, that was my plot and plan. Didn't work out, but <laughs> it was, it was a fun, it was a fun idea at the time. So, um, when it comes to, uh, climate change, this industry is really egregious when it comes to emissions. Um, what what are what changes do you see coming on the horizon for you know changing how ships are powered and maybe crunching down supply lines and all this type of thing do you think there's going to be any movement on that anytime soon oh, yeah for a foreseeable future this is i don't know i really don't know i think that you know there's some project you know ongo ongoing projects right right uh, when it some companies, you know, are using winds. Uh, some companies are powered by, you know, uh, you know, LNG, and so on. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I, what I know is that you know you have what it calls like a maritime, uh, international maritime organization, IMO, which is based in London and also a part of in Sweden. You know, they put it in place uh, their 2020 regulation, which means that shipping companies. Uh, could, must not, you know, um, must not, you know, spread more than, you know, a certain percentage. I don't recall the exact number, but there's some regulation put it in place. You know, uh, is the shipping industry respecting, you know, this uh, those emissions? I'm not sure. I think it's more like of a when it comes to shipping, it's more it's similar to you know the automotive industry, right? To to to. Today we have the solutions to stop using oil and gas, right? When it comes to to cars, uh, but we're still using them, right? So right. I think it will uh, it will require like uh, you know let's say, uh, yeah, a, a structural shock, right? Because uh, when it comes to shipping, it means that uh, you know you have um, shipping co oil companies, you know, relies on shipping. Uh, so it's really, it's, I think it's really, it's going to be really difficult to change it, by the way. But uh, well, let's see. Yeah, I mean, the, the amount of energy required makes it very difficult, um, I think, to, to do the long supply chains like we're used to having, you know, at something that isn't so polluting. I think that's very difficult. It's going. It's going to be. It's going to be a chat. A, a big. I think it's going to be the next challenge for this industry, uh, because now with the global, you know, the global warmings and so on, um, people needs to need to realize that this is uh, this is not this is not a healthy pace. This is not a healthy, an healthy situation for you know for the future generations. So yeah, perhaps I think one of the solution may, will be perhaps wind. But can you? Can you switch an entire industry with uh, wind, considering that you know uh, vessels, you know ships have a you know a life expectancy of thirty years, right? So right now there are still vessels, you know, uh, built in nineteen ninety five, you know, right? If I'm not mistaken, right. was still, you know, still at sea, right? 
So it means that in 1995, we were not even concerned about you know, global warming. You know, I think the Kyoto, Kyoto agreement was in what, what, 1999 or something like that, if I'm not mistaken? 1997, yeah. 97, yes, yeah, correct. So, I mean, you know... Um, you know, it's, it's decades we, away. Uh, I mean, based on what you're saying, it's decades away. I think it's decades away, if not almost a century, let's say, because uh, people are not willing to change. I mean, you could you just let's just look at the, you know the um, let's let's just look at the the automotive industry, for instance, right? Okay, so you, it started to increase into like you know I think like Tesla has a huge starting to have a huge market, right? In 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 the US, in Europe as well. Uh, but nevertheless, when you look at Tesla as well, you know their battery, their lithium battery is not that you know their life. You know, the in terms of recycling uh, lithium battery, I don't think it's uh, really you know healthy for the for the for for the planet. And they explode. Uh, we have... Exactly. We have... There was one. There was one Tesla in a junkyard that had been an accident. The battery exploded and it kept burning so much. The fire department got a container, chopped the top off of it, filled it with water, and dunked the car in it, and it still burnt for another day underwater before it finally went out yeah where where, where did that happen where did it happen where uh that was in california the this person had had a tesla it was in they got in an accident it was taken to a junkyard the battery lit on fire and burned for three days and they had to dunk it in water so yeah i guess yeah yeah it's a, so, yeah. it's a challenge it's a challenge well i think it's uh, beyond you know maritime industry uh, it's uh, yeah, it's um, for the transportation industry in general, even for for planes, even for uh, we need to figure out like a new healthy solutions for the planet, right? Um, so yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it is it is a whole. I mean, I think I think you know semi trucks. I think there's a pathway for that to happen, um, particularly if they can make hydrogen work. I think that will exactly. make make trucks possible. Um, I think ships are going to be the last to get shifted over because you need a lot of power in a very contained setting, and that's difficult, you know. Yeah, that's difficult, and there are tons of interest behind it as well, right? So, of course, uh, yeah, it means like uh, you know. Uh, uh, Chevron is supplying, you know, uh, some containers, container ship, and uh, the containers, the, the you know the um, the shipping industry now saying that they will start with hydrogen. Like you know, Chevron's gonna be pissed, right? So <laughs> it's yes. uh, it's, problematic. it's problematic. It's tons of hiding, you know, hidden interest uh, behind those um, these uh, global warming things, like you know, because we have all the solutions we have all the solutions at our disposal but we are i don't know we are just waiting so yeah <laughs> yeah no that's um if somebody wanted to get into this industry how would you recommend they access it um so first i would say um we're in the industry because this industry is quite large right do you want to work in containerized shipping do you want to work uh, in dry bulk shipping, so dry bulk is everything that cannot be, you know, uh, within a container. Do you want to work on oil and gas? Do you want to? It, it really first it dip, choose first choose your let's say choose your expertise right. Choose your expertise. Then second, um, make sure that you're steadfast and you're determined because it's really difficult to enter into this industry. It's almost like a mafia, right? Because if you don't know someone from this industry, it's really difficult. I had to apply uh, to get, I had to apply, I think to 100 or 200 jobs before I got my, my first job, right? So it yeah. was really, really a challenge. Um, and yes, you need some kind of, uh, I think you need some kind of, let's say, um, um, let's say, yeah, background or you need to, yeah, if, if you can find a mentor, that's better. Uh, but yeah, you need, you need to, you need to be, I think, and even for all industries, you need to be, you know, determined that you're going to make it to, to enter into this industry. And what do you want to do inside this industry? Do you want to work, you know, at the office? Do you want to be a seafarer? Do you want to organize transportation? Do you want to be a broker? So it really depends what you want to do. 
But at the end, uh, you need to be sure that it's going to be really slow because the you know places are you know expensive and people are not will not be willing to uh, give you um, you know a free spot you know like this really right yeah no that that definitely it doesn't make sense well thank you so much for coming on the chemical podcast this has been exciting it's so cool to look into a world that we don't really know or, or anything about <laughs> normally so this has been really great thank you thanks thanks for having me cameron yes now before yes my English was great. <laughs> yes before we yeah before we go why don't you tell us where we can uh where we can get the book and how we can keep in touch with you online Yes, of course. So the book is available on Amazon. Um, you just tap Learn and Storms. Uh, we have a website, learnandstorm.com. And uh, yes, you can follow us on LinkedIn. And uh, yes, that's pretty it. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks, Cameron. That's all for this episode of the Cameron Journal Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Visit us online at CameronJournal.com. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And I love to talk to my followers and listeners, so please feel free to uh, get us on social media at Cameron Cowan on Twitter. And we'll see you next time on the Cameron Journal Podcast.